Hey everyone, this is Daylon and Arun. We're the hosts of the Stem Cell Podcast, back on day four of our video series, rounding up the latest research presented at the 2020 ISSCR virtual meeting. If you're enjoying this series, be sure to check out the Stem Cell Podcast at www.stemcellpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. We've got some great recent episodes, including recent conversations with Dr. Hans Cleavers, Dr. Josef Penninger, and also Carl Kohler. He's also a doctor. Also others, you should check that out. We have some interesting research from the meeting that we want to highlight today. But before we get to that, Arun, tell him. So no conference is complete without a couple of prizes, right? So you can play the stem cell scavenger hunt for a chance to win a daily draw for a prize pack. Find out how to enter by visiting the virtual booth at ISCR or visiting www.stemcell.com slash ISCR 2020. And so we'll dive right into it. We'll dive right into the plenaries. Plenary three was actually from yesterday for, from this recording. So plenary three was focusing on embryogenesis and development. And it's, you know, a number of really high profile researchers and some very cutting edge stuff that's um, been presented here. And one talk in particular that we just were absolutely blown away by the both of us. And we'll get to that in a second. So we started off with Kathy Nyken from the Francis Crick Institute. It's focusing on early lineage specification in the human embryos. I thought it was a pretty neat talk because it talked a little bit about the YAP hip hippo signaling pathway, a pathway that's pretty important for um, cell proliferation. And it was cool to see some of those really early technologies, technologies to modify human embryos at a very early stage. So they CRISPR doc four in early stage embryos. Um, so pretty, pretty neat technical stuff. Next up, Ken Zaret who was looking at uh, changing cell fate at will, and in particular, the role of heterochromatin proteins that impede direct reprogramming. It made me think back to some of Mary's Vernig stuff, you know, using um, some similar genetic modifiers to drive direct reprogramming from one cell type to another. Benoit Bruneau, who is actually going to be joining us on the podcast not too long from now, I uh, was talking about what he does, you know, when it comes to using iPSCs to model congenital heart disease. And in particular, he presented on some pretty neat stuff with a, a particular protein called Brahma, which is a, um, a protein in, that regulates chromatin dynamics. And the, the thought is when you knock out Brahma, when you actually get rid of it, uh, you don't get cardiomyocytes and you get actually a neural fate shift. So that was pretty neat to see a shift entirely from a mesoderm to an ectodermal fate. And then there was a talk that we were both blown away by Dale on. So why don't you, why don't you take it away? Take it away. Yes, this is a bombshell guys. And uh, I can't wait to see the hard data. Uh, and I'm sure I'm not alone there. It's uh, from Georgia Scapin, who's from uh, Vonit Shah's lab at Ohio State. He's uh, formerly in uh, George Daly's lab. And um, this is a huge deal. This is something people have been going after for decades, literally, um, some call it the holy grail of not just hematopoietic stem cell research, but some call it the holy grail of just embryonic stem cell research, period, because of the possibilities it opens up, both just in terms of like knowledge and basic research, but also clinically, therapeutically. Um, and what I'm talking about here is definitive hematopoietic stem cells from pluripotent stem cells. That wasn't, you know, that, they didn't lead with that. Of course, this was a a story that grew out of a really nice concept, and I'm gonna try and summarize as briefly as I can. The bottom line here is that the concept was built from the idea that there's things lacking in vitro that are in vivo, namely, in this case, the pulsatile force of the heart. Um, and so they essentially tried to s simulate that, um, connected that stimulatory process to, or linked it to increased hematopoietic stem cell potential and differentiation. Uh, also in embryonic stem cell cultures and in vivo, connected it to this uh, piezo uh, uh, protein uh, and also then found a small molecule activator of piezo and then put it into ES cells, showed that you could get these so-called definitive hematopoietic stem cells from human pluripotent stem cell input. And this is such a big deal because there have been a lot of reports that have been controversial and have kind of fallen away I think at this point, to put yourself out there saying you have definitive H HSCs from uh, pluripotent stem cells, you'd have to be crazy um, to not assume that you'd be put to such scrutiny. Um, so I thought it was really, really impressive, brave to show the unpublished work, which is now deep in review in nature. And I believe it, to be honest. So 
Um, I don't know. I can't wait to see the hard data, but I'm really excited about the possibility that this could be true. Arun. Yeah, I totally agree. And I defer to you since you're the endothelial guy, but you know, just this was mind blowing stuff. The fact that you can incorporate uh, physiological stimulus like pulsation in the aorta and the fact that it actually can induce this sort of cell fate shift from endothelial to hematopoietic, it's, I think it's absolutely tremendous. And really it's, uh, it's spanning the gamut, right? You're going in vitro to in vivo and understandably, this is just going to be a huge paper whenever it comes out in nature. I hope it's tomorrow. Can't wait to read it. <laughs> well, she did say on the q and A. I I mean, there's also other mechanism in there, by the way, that I explained with the DMT3B. Uh, yeah. Congratulations, George, escaping. This is amazing work. And I think the real key is going to be whether you got secondary transplant. Someone asked in the Q&A, do they engraft secondary? And she said kind of tentatively, they, they don't have the final numbers yet, but it looks good. Um, and that's huge. And by the way, with the primary transplant, I looked at the numbers because it finally came up and I replayed it about six times. And uh, eight out of eight engraftment, you know, N equals eight, all of the, the groups engrafted and summed up as 25%. So it's unprecedented. Um, get ready, guys. You're going to need to be culturing uh, human pluripotent stem cells and some hematopoietic differentiation media pretty soon to capitalize on this if you're interested. And on that note, we have a message from Stem Cell Technologies. You can check out an upcoming product from Stem Cell Technologies. Culture and expand human hematopoietic cells in animal component-free conditions with stem span ACF without phenol red. Manufactured under CGMP conditions. That's going to be important to getting these to the clinic. You can sign up now to be the first to know when it's available at stemcell.com slash ISSCR 2020 dash FTK. And just to finish up the plenaries, there was Elaine Fuchs, who's a hero of mine. Uh, I've always admired her since my early days at Rockefeller University. Um, she did what she does, which she told a beautiful story and beautiful pictures and beautiful mechanism, um, everything beautiful. And uh, I invite you to... to check that out because there are more stories than I can handle. A lot of them published, a little bit of unpublished work, um, but very, very uh, beautiful work. Uh, so I invite you to check that out. Arun, um, is that it for the plenary? We're on to the concurrence. Or you got anything to say about Elaine? Yeah, almost there. Just a couple last things about Dr. Fuchs. Obviously, she's an absolute pioneer when it comes to all things skin, skin stem cell biology. That's her model system of choice. Uh, one of the papers that she actually talked about in her presentation was a paper that we covered in the podcast, actually, the role of lymphatics and regulating stem cell regeneration. I think we covered that a couple months ago. And then there was actually some unpublished work, I believe, or maybe it just got published, but the role in P of pH mm. in regulating cell fate. So it's kind of similar to what we were talking about with the, the, pulse, the pulsation of the aorta in regulating you know, stem cell fate. We have another biochemical process, biophysical process, that's kind of doing the same thing in terms of uh, in pH. So really, really important stuff to think about outside of this, just the traditional genetics um, based approaches. And so now we can go over to today's concurrent session. This is current concurrent number three, I believe. I actually, okay, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Today, I did spend a little bit more time on the cardiac <laughs> side of things. I figured that yesterday was under 25%. Today, I can go a little closer to 50%. So please forgive me. Uh, and there, I mean, there were some great talks to listen to. So I started off by listening to Christine Mummerin. You know, she's, of course, a pioneer in all things basic cardiac stem cell biology, and she was the moderator for the cardiac session. Uh, starting off, we had Tim Hoy from Tanaya Therapeutics, actually. This is a biotech company in San Francisco that was using an optimized gene therapy for direct cardiac reprogramming. I thought this was pretty neat because this is something that's been in the works for a long time now. I know about a decade ago, Deepak Srivastava's lab actually came out with that direct cardiac reprogramming paper. And a lot of people initially thought, okay, that's cool, but it's not very efficient. But here, Tanaya is actually taking that and trying to adopt it to adapt it to a, um, a translational approach, so an actual gene therapy. And they're able to see that there's a, actually a dual myocardial ASCL1-driven reprogramming approach contained in an AAV that can direct uh, regeneration and improve function um, in, in animal models. So they want to they push that towards the clinic, potentially. So really cool to see. 
Next thing, there was a Shinshin Shu from the University of Pittsburgh using IPS models for um, uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, he made a number of different IPS lines from people who had this disease. Uh, we also had Farnaz Shamsi using, uh, this is actually on the endoderm session. I switched over away from the <laughs> cardiac session for this one. Uh, vascular smooth muscle derived progenitors contribute progenitors contribute to brown adipocyte development. So this is, uh, this is something I didn't know too much about. You know, there's brown fat and that's actually induced by cold. So they were able to show that these uh, vascular smooth muscle progenitors can contribute to the development of these brown adipocytes and it's regulated by, uh, by temperature, temperature gradient. He did a number of really cool single cell analysis there. Sharif Iqbal using extracellular matrix to, to define stem cell function in the, uh, in the intestine. And that old extracellular matrix can actually reduce stem cell properties in the, in the intestine. Lika Droklis, who is recapitulating early heart development with uh, iPSCs. And actually, this is, this is a really neat um, bio, uh, let's say, bioengineering presentation sort of it was uh, it was organoids so cardiac organoids that in the words of benoit bruno who's actually in the chat look like little donuts so there are little donuts of myocardium that were glowing green and uh, the neat thing about this technology is i haven't really seen anything like this before was that they can uh, actually produce mesendoderm so you have an organoid that has a cardiac core but also some foregut foregut cells in there too so maybe this is mimicking the the forming foregut that's adjacent to the forming heart tube in the early stage embryo who knows so that was that was a really neat uh, presentation there and then the the last thing um you know, the last talk I actually went to was Janet Rossent's talk, and she was defining totipotency in mouse stem cells. Uh, this is some unpublished work. It was it was a nice transition into the the women in science session that you know we'll both touch on in a little bit after uh, after Daylon talks about his concurrent session. Um, but Janet Rossent's talk was you know, once again hopefully hunting down these so-called totipotent stem cells and to see if they actually exist, right? We all know pluripotent stem cells exist. There's naive cells, it's primed, but are totipotent stem cells a reality? And so they were getting pretty close. They have like an international collaboration where they're trying to make these things happen. Uh, they're not quite there yet, but it was really cool to see some of the unpublished work. Wow, you, got, you were busy. You weren't I all cardiac. I respect, <laughs> I respect your choices. Um, I made different choices. I'm just going to touch on four of them I thought were highlights for me. There was Z Chen. It was a little bit not off the wall at all. It was just, I like it when people take it back. Uh, Z Chen was out of Keelong Ying's lab at USC. And what they were doing was generating uh, avian ESCs. And I feel like everyone kind of moved on from the let's generate ESCs from all kinds of species. Uh, efforts and but not not the Keelong Ying's lab and Zi Chen went Rambo and generated them from pheasant goose all these different avian species and I thought what was really notable is that you had to suppress cardiomite differentiation in order to get from other species besides the chicken so I don't know there may be some mechanism to mm -hmm. chase down there uh, Valerie Guan Evans who you know she's been working in the liver forever now at BU uh, and there's you know she's had this story that's been elusive uh, for a while that, that uh, people have been interested in about uh, VEGFR2 cells in the liver as a kind of a progenitor with potential to go to both, you know, hepatic and endothelial fate. And she builds on that using uh, VEGF mod RNA in this case, so treating the liver with uh, VEGF for liver, liver regeneration that's in Nature Communications in Revision. Uh, the other one, by the way, from Ji Chen, also unpublished. So there's some nice unpublished work. Um, next, it was Alan Trounson, who I got to give him a nod because, you know, he's one of the old guard uh, reproductive biologists as well. I'm, I'm really interested in reproductive biology nowadays. He was looking at ovarian cancer, solid tumor targeting with CAR-T. My one comment there, although the, 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 it was impressive that they're targeting a solid tumor and they have these really nice data in mouse, I would say that um, given all the other data you see here with CAR-T in humans in late trials, you know, with amazing results, and now they're kind of moving on to the more engineered uh, 
kind of uh, synthetic biology kind of approaches. It kind of seems like Alan's a little bit behind, but um, he's got a company. He's got a, a I think it's called Carther Cartherics or something. Check it out. Um, he's got a few tens of millions of dollars to uh, solve ovarian solid tumors there. And, and the data is impressive, I must say. And then speaking of that, you know, talking about translational um, aspects and clinical aspects, the last thing I have to highlight here is Judith Shizuru from Stanford. And I was just really impressed here because I don't get that c close a look at the clinical translational stuff. And th th she was talking about an early study, a study at early stages where they're looking at this alternative to the myoablative, like chemotherapeutic myoablation, uh, busulfane, you know, that looking at uh, more gentle, this antibody approach using C-kit, antibodies against C-kit, and showed some really impressive data. And just, just for me, it's like kernels of like, how does these ideas, and you get these effective results in the mouse, and like, again, another theme that's been recurring in all the industry talks is, how do you bring that to market? And just realizing all the little details that are important. So those four talks, I think, for me, were really important. I also want to highlight here the moderators. There have been a lot of great moderators, oh, and yeah. it's been a struggle with the technology. Yeah. Um, I just want to highlight, in particular, uh, Conrad Hockedlinger. Sorry about that, buddy. I always do it um, with the name. I'm not the only one. And Valentina Greco are great ambassadors and showed such um, care in their moderation. Also in the, in the early scientist panel, I didn't mention it yesterday, but you guys should check that out if you're early in your career. They really have some really, really great insight on how to navigate um, just opening your own lab. And they were just such gentle and, and careful yeah. moderators. So great job, guys. I, I nominate you for the highest position in the ISSCR. And my nomination carries weight. Um, and that brings <laughs> us to the uh, women in science panel, which I was creeping on. And I wasn't the only one. There were a lot of men there, right, Arun? Yeah, absolutely. It was it was a great panel. Um, like I talked about, um, the last talk I went to before actually transitioning into that women in science panel was uh, Janet Rossen's talk, and of course she is, and you know, she is a hero for a lot of women and also men in science. So she's actually uh, on the podcast back in the day, right? Isn't that right, David? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, she so, was one of my the, time. One of the best. One of the best episodes ever. Um, right, right. I also want to say that on a technical note, uh, Mamari was, she, they really put her work on this one, huh? She was uh, running the, this panel and uh, moderating it, and they had some cool elements. I have to say, my prediction is that like the live poll thing was so cool um, with the instant feedback. And it's just the fact, like, if you ask everybody to raise their hand in a convention hall, you would see nothing, right? Because everyone's so self-conscious. But this digital input where you can ask questions mm -hmm. and it shows yeah. up in the chat and um, that I predict that that's going to be just adopted widespread. And also in terms of the, the panel, I want to I want to uh, shine a light on uh, Varsha Bargava, who was blowing up the chat with some really nice insights, was stimulating and stoking the conversation, I think, mm -hmm. in a thoughtful way. And all the all the chat members I thought were being really constructive and, and I could really see how uh, a, a chat box could complement um, the, the whole thing. So yeah, it, w it was a really, I thought it was a really great, great experience for me. And I, I, I didn't go last year because I was too embarrassed, frankly, and I'm ashamed to say that now. Yeah, it was fantastic. It was a real who's who of amazing women stem cell biologists and biologists in general, right? So we had Christine Mummery, Rana Dajani, Masayo Takahashi, and Sangeeta Bhatia, who we actually talked about a little bit yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, they're really encouraging women biologists and trainees to, quote unquote, choose the profession and participate in the changes of it. So mm -hmm. really powerful quote there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um... Yes, some other takeaways. The COVID was disproportionately affecting women. Uh, yeah, and Sangeeta was great. Uh, Rana Dajani, I thought was hysterical, but also just a, a nice um, perspective that you don't see a lot. You know, I look around in our academic halls and I don't see people representing her view. And, you know, it really is, is especially pertinent now with all the upheaval related to, you know, Black Lives Matter and racial justice that you should think of this. When I was in this panel, I was like, wow, this all the things we're talking about, you know, I'm reading this book, White Fragility. You think there's this other element as two males here. We should start talking about our male fragility. And we should start talking about how we have to be an active part of the change. And we have to kind of give. We've got to give 
a little bit, you know? It's easy to stand in our position because we benefit from the imbalance and just say, hey, well, I'm not a misogynist. I'm not partaking in this discriminatory mm -hmm. process. But you know what? You might be. If you've ever looked around to see if there's a woman around before you said something, you've been participating. So think about it. Check yourself. And that's all I have to say. I'm not, you know, an, an activist per se, but I, I've got to do better. I know myself. Yep. You have to be actively participating in the change that you believe in, right? So actually, I made a, a brief mistake. This uh, particular concurrence session that we just talked about, that was from yesterday. And now we're going to talk about the concurrence from this morning, um, this morning being Friday morning. So I actually, again, sort of focused on the cardiac side of things. I'm sorry, but the talks were so cool, man. So first one I went to was uh, moderated by Chuck Murray, who was, of course, an expert up there at the University of Washington. He did some of the stuff on uh, introducing iPS cardiomyocytes into primate hearts, which is actually one of the talks that was included in this session. We'll, we'll get to that. He gave an overview of some of the clinical applications of cardiac muscle and iPSCs into cardiac muscle. And then we had Militia Bradishis, who was from the University of Toronto. She's super well known when it comes to heart on a chip engineering, uh, particularly talked about her BioWire platform, which has been published, but they're trying to take that to the next level. They're trying to make this custom bioengineered approach that can actually mature cardiomyocytes and scale it too. So she actually had a version of this BioWire platform that you could throw into like a 96 well plate. And that was, mm. that was pretty neat. Chuck Murray actually asked a, a, an important question in this particular session though. He asked, can we actually recapitulate maturation just by using small molecules, just by using small molecules alone, as opposed to these pacing-based approaches that a lot of the, the cardiac bioengineers are, are taking? And the speaker, Dr. Radishus, actually said no. She was a little bit pessimistic. She was mm. saying, no, we got to pace these things. Uh, it's tough to recapitulate this um, completely by using small molecules and growth factors. Well, what's the answer? I guess we'll have to wait and find out. Next up, we had um, Serena Domenig, who is from the from Switzerland, ETH Zurich, who is using iPS-derived myogenic progenitors to actually treat DMD or Duchenne's. This is a, a unique approach because this is in contrast to kind of what Eric Olson was talking about the other day. So instead of using CRISPR to, to correct DMD and uh, had to take this exon skipping approach that he's kind of pioneered, uh, she was hoping to actually use more of a cell therapy for tr treating Duchenne. So that was a unique approach. Another talk that we thought was, uh, th that I thought was pretty cool was from Irene De Lazaro. She's talking about transient reprogramming of cardiomyocytes to other cell types through a burst of the Yamanaka factors. And this is sort of in contrast to Deepak Srivastava's work of the direct reprogramming where uh, she's actually talking about just the OKSM expression as opposed to, um, uh, and reverting back to an IPS state as opposed to skipping that IPS state intermediate uh, entirely. Uh, we had Frank Secreto, who another cardiac guy. Sorry about that, but this is the this is a really neat talk I thought, and this is something that we actually both touched on. I think Dale and you were actually on this talk as well. He was talking about the successful engraftment of IPS derived lineages into immunosuppressed macaques, okay? And this is something that, for one, it's expensive, so not a whole lot of people are doing it. And two, it's really difficult, so not a whole lot of people are doing it, hmm. right? Uh, but one of the people who, who was doing it was Chuck Murray, right? So he's actually, his claim to fame a couple of years ago was actually first introducing iPS cardiomyocytes into these uh, immunosuppressed non-human primate models. And he actually saw, saw that they induced arrhythmias. But the cool thing I thought about this talk was uh, Dr. Secreto demonstrated that there weren't actually any arrhythmias induced in, in this particular model. And finally, I guess the, the last thing I, I looked at was a talk by Dennis Axel. Uh, this is really neat. It was optogenetically activated FGFR1. Um, mm. So a, a cutting edge model to study early human development and potentially study pluripotency as well. So that's pretty much all I covered, but you know, a million different talks that we didn't discuss and certainly 
like as I don't want to be a broken record here. You got to check out the poster session, right? You have to check out the posters because if you thought there's a lot of talks that you missed, you know, when it comes to the concurrent sessions, just imagine what's waiting for you in the poster sessions, right? So definitely check it out. It's all available for 30 days online. So you don't have any excuse not to check it out, right? Yeah. And the interface is really, I, I was messing around with it yesterday and today. It's really nice and searchable. So yeah, you really do have no excuse. For me, the this concurrence three session, I have to say, was a bit of a letdown. Multiple reasons. One is I came there from my man Shaheen, who is you know well known in the field. Even though I know the science, you just always got to show up because he's so entertaining and so well spoken. And uh, they blew him up. His audio video was just a disaster. I don't think there's been a worse technical you know, misalignment in the whole, and not, none of the talks I saw. So he still managed to salvage it over the phone and brought his ideas across and everyone was totally impressed and blown up and blown over. But um, I still, I was disappointed. Shaheen, old man, they screwed you. Uh, but other than that, you know, I, I my expectations were met with Shaheen in spite of the technical difficulties, but other than that, I wasn't overwhelmed. Apart from the Secreto, I think that you're right. That was really impressive. Uh, just nuts and bolts, hard work, expensive work, and showing a significant contribution. And yeah, less arrhythmia is maybe a minor little blip on one of the monkeys. I think he attributed that to the fact that the 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 cells were more suited to that ventricle or something, and makes sense. So that was impressive. Apart from that, there was Sebastian Uzel from the Lewis Lab at Vies, which I was excited about until I saw that the work was published. I got to the talk and I was like, oh, he published this. So I didn't see any unpublished there, although it's pretty cool with the whole 3D printing thing and the tissue uh, and perfusible network. So it's worth checking out, uh, but you could also just read the paper. And most of all, I think I went for the for the the talk from Metalopov Shukrad. He's a friend. I love admire him. I mean, he's a god um, when it comes to reprogramming SCNT. But uh, I think, you know, he, he didn't really come in with a lot of new data and, and the presentation, I think was a little underwhelming given his history and his renown. So I was disappointed with the session as a whole, but the day was great. I think anchored by that Women in Science panel. I loved this morning uh, and I'm getting ready for the afternoon, Arun. Uh, but that's it for this video episode. We're going to have to come back at you tomorrow for the final one. We'll talk about the afternoon's events. Um, like I said, that brings us to the end of day four. You can make sure to follow us though on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast. You can find out what we're doing at ISSCR 2020 if we haven't told you enough. Check back here tomorrow too for a roundup of all the interesting research that's taken place in the previous 24 hours. That's going to be our last one and it's going to be jam-packed. We'll have a little bit of review sentiments, maybe our best of, maybe our all-star team of scientists. I don't know. We're going to work on it and get back to you. Be there. Uh, thanks for joining us for this one, you guys. We'll see you tomorrow.